talked about, or just all the ones on the, the lab page? All the ones on the lab page. There are some additional calculations I didn't talk about on the lab page, in particular the Hess's law calculations. Yeah, so for the calorimetry, make, uh, you're just going to be submitting the report form that's in the lab manual. For the sulfate, you'll be turning in the formal report, that one. If you want, you could uh, turn in a rough draft or show me a rough draft next week. I can point you in the right direction for that. Also, if your partner dropped or if you want to work with somebody for the report, you can you can do that. I'll just pick the better data set. Okay, any others? What is it? CLO four minus. Electrons, you know, like 32 electrons. And then um, we'll just put chlorine in the center. And oxygen, oxygen bonds aren't very favorable. Those would be mainly peroxide type points. So let's put the four oxygens there. And then complete the octets. Yeah. Well, let's take a look. The next thing we do is the formal charges. What are the formal charges? Yeah, each oxygen is minus. And the chlorine is. Plus three. Plus three is a very high formal charge in an atom like chlorine. And so to reduce the formal charge, we propose to do um, a double bond. And so one double bond would, well, you know, when you look at the hybridization around chlorine, what is the hybridization around chlorine? It's sp3. And so if we just look at the um, Valence orbitals. We have sp3, and we're going to have um, plus three on the chlorine. It normally has seven electrons, but if we lose three of them, we're only left with four electrons. Yeah. And then the chlorines come in. Chlorines are not chlorines. Oxygens. Oxygens will be what hybridization. SP3. So we, we're going to form SP3, SP3 bonds. And these particular bonds are called sigma bonds here. <clears throat> so that would be it. But since this is quite a high formal charge, um, we might think of ways to reduce the formal charge. One way to reduce the formal charge is to give the electron density from oxygen to chlorine by forming a double bond. And so if we did that, we would generate these structures here. This oxygen is going to have a formal charge of, and these will be the same as minus. But the chlorine now is going to be plus two. How many resonance forms can we make for this? 
Yeah, all together four. And so plus three, three more. Okay. Right here in the form. Depending on where we get the double bond. But what's going to happen um, with the bonding? So if we just look at the valence, we're going to have SP3. And SP3, well, um, chlorine is plus two. Normally has seven electrons. So chlorine's going to have five electrons. But I don't see any pairs on chlorine. So where do, where do I put the fifth electron? I've used, this is the 3S, I've used the 3S and the 3, 3P orbitals. And so where can I put the extra electron? Well, I can put it in the 4S. Should I put it in the 4S? No, I shouldn't put it in the 4S. Instead, I should put it in the 3D. So we'll have one electron here. And so basically, oxygen is going to come in here and bond with a single bond. Another oxygen, single bond, single bond. And then this last oxygen here is going to form a double bond. But what type of bond is that? Well, oxygen's hybridization is sp, this oxygen here, sp2. So one of the bonds is going to be an sp2 overlapping with an sp3, or with an sp2, sp3. And the overlap is straight on. So it's a sigma bond. It's what happens when you have straight on. The other type of overlap is going to be a D on sulfur, the D orbital, and bonding with a P orbital on oxygen. So that would be a DP. We talked about this yesterday. Or PD pi bond. So we're going to have one sigma bond here and one pi bond. And that's going to account for the double bond here. But the frontal charge is still a bit high. So alternately, what we can do is uh, we can try this. We can try making two double bonds. And that's going to drop the chlorine's formal charge from plus two to plus one. Yeah. How many resonance forms for this can you draw? So what we do when we try to figure out resonance forms is we pin the atoms down. And then what I do is I leave one of the double bonds fixed and then move this one. So if I leave this one, I'm going to have top right as one resonance form, top bottom, and top left. And so top right, top bottom, top left is going to be three. And then what? Okay, let's leave this one here. Well, I already did top right, but I'll do right, left, right, bottom. That's five. And then maybe I'll do this one down here. Well, I already did right, left, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do bottom, left. That's six. So six resonance forms we could draw for this, I'm giving us all the variation. But the bonding here is going to get a bit tricky. The bonding here is going to be, well, it's still sp3. How many electrons does chlorine have? It's supposed to have seven, but because of the charge, it's going to have 
sick. So the first four are going to go in the SB3. Where do the remaining two go? The remaining two are going to go into unhybridized D. And so we're going to form a scenario where we're going to have two double bonds. Yeah. And so we'll have an oxygen single bond here, oxygen single bond here, oxygen double bond here, and one more oxygen double bond here. And so we're going to form two PD pi bonds, but this isn't going to be as favorable because D orbitals are at what angle relative to one another. So if I have the DXY, then the DXZ is going to be perpendicular to it. And so the angle should be 90 degrees. And so here I'm going to have to have two D orbitals overlapping at an angle of 90 degrees. Um, no. It's not 90 degrees here. The, the actual angle in tetrahedral is what? One oh nine. And so at one oh nine, there's gonna be some strain. We aren't gonna get good overlap. Good overlap is just like this. You know, and this is why I had some of you guys redraw it. Let's say I have um an oxygen here with an sp3, and I want to overlap this with a chlorine sp3. They're going to overlap like this. When we have overlap like this, this is called sigma. Because if I look at the internuclear axis and draw a line through the internuclear axis, the overlap is occurring within the internuclear axis. And so this would be an sp3, sp3 sigma bond. But the one that's double bonding is going to be a little bit different. The one that's double bonding is going to be um, an sp2. And so we don't want to draw a double bond like this. You know, normally when we draw a bond, it's a straight line. You know, this would be the bond. If I drew an, an oxygen chlorine bond, should I draw a kink like that to show that the electron density goes up and then it goes down? No, we don't draw bonds like kink like this. And so this is what we call poor orbital overlap. We might get over orbital overlap like that. When we introduce another bond, like here, We'll have zero to have overlap. So, chlorine, uh, that chlorine is still going to be sp3. We're going to have sp3, but now the oxygen is going to be sp2. So, sp2. And so, this would be a sigma bond where the overlap is within the intermolecular axis. Let's get overlap there. But then we're going to take an unhybridized d orbital. like this, and an unhybridized p orbital, like this, and then we're going to have overlap this way. And so it's going to overlap these two lobes here and these two lobes, and that's going to create one p d pi bond. And so we have overlap outside the internuclear axis. In fact, in, in the internuclear axis, there's a node, a nodal plane. And so this is going to be on the left and the right side of the intermediate axis here. This is called the pi bond. We have the sigma and the pi bond. And the situation with this is the next PD pi bond has to be at a 109 angle here, but you know, when we look at the D orbitals, the D orbitals aren't at 109 angles. The D orbitals are 90 degree angles. And so adding a second PD pi bond. Well, that's not favorable. Adding a second PP by bond, no problem. And so when I get the two double bonds, maybe not, you know, maybe not just because of the geometry of the D orbital and how they're going to overlap. Like this, it's not going to be great overlap. It's going to be keen like that. Unless they hybridize somewhat. The third structure that's proposed to this 
is this, but there's one more structure that's proposed. And the one more structure that's proposed to this is this. The appeal of this structure is that uh, it minimizes formal charge. Take a look at the formal charges now. What are the formal charges now? They're all zero. Um, since this is per chlorine, there's got to be some residual charge here. Making an anode. And we can't minimize that formal charge. There's got to be a charge. All the other charges are good, but at what cost? At what cost? The cost is going to be how many PV pi bonds are we going to have to make? We're going to have to make three PV pi bonds at tetrahedral angles. Are we going to have good over, over overlap? No, because the angles are only going to be tweaked. We can't get them to go straight on, either in a sigma sense or in a pi sense. The first one, yes. The first one will work great. So one double bond, I don't think is a problem. But two and then going to three double bonds, that may be a problem. You know? And so, what should we do? Well, um, let's take a look at perchlorate and see what most people do. Let's see a four minus. What did most people do? Look by it. Yeah, it looks like they went all out and did three double bonds. That's what it looks like, doesn't it? And then we're going to have resonance forms for this. How many resonance forms are we going to have? Let's try to count them. So I'm going to, let's fix two of these, top and bottom. And then I could have right or left, that's two. And then let's fix top right. That means I can have left because I already did bottom. And so that's three. And then let's go top and bottom. Did I already do that? Yeah, then let's go top left. If I go top left, then I've already done that, but I haven't done this. And so that's four. So plus on this. The reality is it's going to be kind of hard, so the compromise might be somewhere in between. So usually what's done is this. What's done is a hybrid of all the structures. So you take all the structures and then you average it, like some, some of these are more stable than others. And so the contribution from this might, you know, it's not going to be an even contribution from all of them. It depends. Or we just go with this. But the formal charge is kind of high. And so what we could do is we could do quantum mechanical calculations or whatnot and see what is the charge on that chlorine? Is it pretty high? You know, because the formal charge and oxidation state are just estimates of what the um, actual charge are, is.
see if I can see the abstract here. Uh, now these are um, quantum mechanical calculations. All valence non-empirical. This is not a very good abstract. There is no name in the paper. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a Spartan, otherwise we can calculate right now, and let's see. So what are we going to do? Well, it depends on how much D plays a role. But what we're doing is we're doing minimal D contribution, or no D contribution. And so what we'll do is we'll just stop here with the octet and high formal charges. We're not going to do the expanded octet because those quantum mechanical calculations say that the 3D orbitals are too high in energy to, to access, um, being in the fourth shell. Hmm? Yeah, right. We're just going to maintain the octet. Because the formal charges are quite high. Which means the um, percent ionic character is going to be quite high as well. The ones we did yesterday were had more things bonded to it. You know, this only has four things bonded to it, so, you know, if I had five things bonded to it, then that's what we call an expanded octet. This is, this is called um, using DP pi bonding, and it's an expanded octet um, if we can access the D orbitals to make the pi bond. Okay. DP pi bonding is... Mitchell.
Well, anyway, uh, let's take a look. So um, this is one of the issues that we're going to run into with Bailey's bond theory. <coughs> Valence bond theory has some failures. So far, the tools that we use to understand these molecules. Uh, um, Lewis theory. Let's see. Lewis theory being Lewis structure. So we we use the Lewis structures, Vesper, and valence bond. Uh, these tools make a potent combination for describing covalent bonding and molecular and ionic you know, polyatomic ionic structures. They are satisfactory for most of our purposes. Sometimes Chemists need a greater understanding of molecular structures and properties than these methods provide. And um, the valence bond is based on quantum mechanics, but there's actually a, a more rigorous approach. A valence bond is the light approach, the light method. The heavy method would be molecular orbital theory. And so, once we get her chlorine molecular orbital theory, all this stuff goes away. And I choose so many structures for this. You don't do that for molecular orbital theory. For molecular orbital theory, we're going to generate one structure. That's it. So we aren't going to have a whole bunch of resonance forms. We aren't going to have to hybridize all these. We aren't going to have to weigh them. Like, okay, this is going to be the most stable. Maybe it's 80% stable. This one's the least stable. Maybe it's 5% contributor. And then we make some kind of weighted hybrid. Average. No, what gets fit out in MO theory is uh, just the one structure, the optimized structure. And so, this is a lot of work. Um, but it isn't really a lot of work. This is a lot of work on pencil and paper. And so, the great thing about valence bond theory is you don't need math, you don't have to do any calculation. Okay, once we get into the MO theory, even though we're just generating one structure, we need a lot of math for that. In fact, the math is too much. We have to use computers to do it. And so when we generate the structure, what I wanted to do is I wanted to see somebody who already did the calculations in MO theory and just tell me what the charge on chlorine is. Once I know what the charge on chlorine is, which one does it match the closest to it? Zero or plus three? Okay. That'll give me an idea of how ionic the bonds are. You know, at zero charge, pretty much, you know, zero on And so this is one of the shortcomings of valence bond. Yeah. But there are more shortcomings for valence bond theory as well. One of those um, is uh, this. It's not really a big shortcoming. I mean, we overcome it using hybrids, but it's delocalized electrons. Not, these aren't total failures, for example. The valence bond theory in Lewis structures and Vesper give us. Um, they give us what are called the localized. Electron cloud. Let's take a look at a molecule here. 
localized electrons. So um, an example of this would be benzene. Benzene has a formula C6H6. So we have six carbons and six hydrogens. Six carbons is going to get a 24 valence electron. Six hydrogens will get a six valence electron. So all the other will have 30 valence electrons. We're going to ignore the core electrons and carbon. And then we're going to put them together. If we make a chain of carbon, we will never get an octet. The only way we can get an octet is if we make a ring of carbon atoms. So let's go ahead and make a ring. And then let's attach the six hydrogens to this, one on each carbon, like that. And then let's count how many electrons I've used so far. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. 24 electrons. That means there's six electrons left over. So six electrons left over should go to the terminal atoms, but the terminal atoms don't want any more electrons here. The terminal atoms are hydrogen. Usually the terminal atoms are most electronegative. In this case, um, if the terminal atoms don't want it, then we have to put them on the central atoms. And so we have six of them, but so it's spread out to six. Like this. Okay, how does that look to you? It looks bad. I have an octet on this carbon, but do I have an octet on this carbon? No. What's the formal charge on this carbon? Plus one, the formal charge on this carbon? Minus. And so one carbon ends up taking an electron from another carbon. Is that stable? No. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get rid of the lone pair and we're gonna make double bond. Here. If we make double bonds here, um, that's going to give us octets. Do we have octets on all the carbons now? Okay. Uh, no, so one's not good. Do you see one that's not good? Yeah, this one. This carbon has two, four, six, eight, ten electrons. So I'm going to fill up. The valence shell, where should I put the extra electrons? I know. I know where we can put the extra electrons. The carbon is um, two. I'm looking at the valence. That's what I'm doing the valence. The core I'm not going to write. So the carbon is going to be, let's say, 2s, 2p. And um, we're going to have five electrons. So where should I put the fifth electron? Should I put it in the 3s? The 3p? In other words, should I put it in the next shell? 3s, 3p? No. I should put it in the 4s? No. 3d? How about the 3d? Should I go jump up two shells and go to the 3d? Do you think that's favorable? No. If there were 2d, but there's no such thing as a 2d. So this is impossible. We can never expand the octet on the second period because there's no place to put the electron except in the next shell. And in the next shell, it's energetically unfavorable. It's going to cost you too much energy. And so I, let me just move the double bond over there. Now how does this structure look? Yeah, this structure is good. This is a structure for benzene. For benzene, um, what's the hybridization? So I'm just going to draw the orbitals. So one sp2 here. This sp2 is going to be bonded to a hydrogen one. One s. This hydrogen one s is very small. Mine is over exaggerated. It's too big. And then we're going to have another sp2 here, and another sp2 here. This sp2 is going to be bonded to the carbon down here, and this carbon down here is going to be sp2 also.
So this is our um, carbon carbon sp2 sigma bond. Whenever we have a double bond, the double bond consists of one sigma bond, which is this, and one pi bond. And so what does the pi bond look like in the double bond? And so this is what I call the top view. So there's going to be a p orbital here and a p orbital here. And so the second bond in the double bond is going to consist of a pp pi. And so we'll have an electron here and an electron here. We're going to have that. Um, we can also put this into a side view so that we can see the overlap. Versus over here, we just have a carbon. And this carbon is going to be sp2 as well. And so this is just going to be a regular sp2, sp2 sigma bond. Which is going to be stronger? A single bond or a double bond? A double bond. A double bond is going to be stronger because it has more electron density between the nuclei. This is going to have the sigma electron density here, but in addition to the sigma, it also has the pi. The pi is going to be above and below the plane of this. So if we put it in profile, you would see the pi overlap. And so double bonds are going to be stronger and shorter because the, the greater the negative charge density here pulls in the positive nuclei closer to it. And so I didn't really draw this like that. This bond's short, this bond's long. Okay, and then this bond will be short, and so it's going to alternate short, long, short, long, short, long. So it's not going to be a perfect hexagon. It's... Um, it's going to be kind of a distorted hexagon. And so we can continue this um, structure here. We'll have another sp2. We'll have this sp2 out here. This is going to bond to hydrogen S. Then we'll have another sp2 here. Can you see it? So we have a bunch of sp2, sp2 sigma bonds. And then we're going to have pi bonds here. There's going to be another pi bond here. And so there's going to be p orbital sticking out. We're going to get a pp pi bond here. And another pi bond here. The orbital sticking out. So this is the top view. If I drew the side view and take a look at the p orbitals, here's my one of the pi bonds. Here's another of the pi bonds, and the last of the pi bonds are yeah. That'll be it. All right, so what this structure shows is localized pi bonds. Pi bonds localized between these two carbons, these two carbons, and these two carbons. But there's a resonance form for this. Because what, what can happen is I'll just move the electron, the pi bonding electron, one over. If I move all of them one over, then we're going to end up with this.
Um, what it's going to generate is the resonance structure. For this. The resonance structure is drawing the double bonds in the alternate side. So here, here, here. So basically, the electrons can move from here forward to here. If you look at how the um, T orbitals are aligned, do you see, rather than linking these two T orbitals, we link these two. They're, they're still right next to each other. And so we end up with that. And so when people think about resonance forms, they think about it resonating. You know, like this bond, short, and then it goes long, short, long, short, long, short, so it's resonating. But in reality, it's not resonating at all. Do you know what the um, true structure is closest to? The true structure is closest to the resonance hybrid. And that is a mixing of these two. Okay. The hybrid structure is going to look like this. And so I'm going to draw the shorthand hybrid structure. And the way we can visualize it is this. If I try to put two feet of water here, and then one foot of water here, but there's nothing, there's no wall blocking these. And so it can easily overlap this way. What's going to happen? Well, it's going to be like water, and it's going to just spread out. And so I can't have twice the electron density here as I have here, because it's just going to spread out evenly just like water would, unless there's a wall. If there's a wall here, then it's localized. If there's no wall here, then it's what we call delocalized. And so one of the problems with um, valence bond theory is everything comes out localized. And in order to delocalize it, we have to draw out all the resonance forms and then come up with a resonance hybrid. Well, then you think, well, that's OK. We can do that. Then, then delocalization is not a problem. If you can do this, then it's not a problem. But when we do our valence bond analysis, it's much easier to use one of the resonance forms to look at all the orbitals like I did here than the hybrid. In this case, it's not that difficult. You know, if I wanted to spread out the cloud density, I see, you know, the orientation of all the P orbitals, they can all overlap. And so the electron cloud is spread out evenly over this. And this is what we call um, a conjugated pi bonding network. Whenever we have single, double, single, double, then all the p orbitals are going to line up because of hybridization is sp2. And if that's the case, then we have this delocalization due to this conjugated, you know, alternating double, single network. And so we have something called bond order. And so a bond order of two means it's a double bond. A bond order of one means it's a single bond. In this structure, all the bonds are exactly the same. And do you know what the bond order is? The bond order is 1.5. In other words, if I had alternating one foot, two foot, one foot, two foot of water, then it's going to settle down to a bubble of one and a half feet deep. But there's more to it than this. Because the double bond's stronger. You know, you have more electron cloud holding the nuclei together than a single bond. A one and a half bond, well, this is one and a half bond due to this. This conjugated network um, creates a class of organic chemi chemicals called the aromatics. The aromatics, not necessarily because they smell nice. The aromatics, um, for a different reason. The aromatics all share this in common. They have delocalized pi bonding networks like this, alternating single and double bond. So when we have that, we have an additional stability. This is. You know, aromatic stability 
which makes the bond stronger than a one and a half bond. And so because of this delocalization, you get bonds that are stronger than expected overall. You know, double bond is still stronger, but you know, not even. And so when we look at the actual structure of benzene, it's going to look like this. Actually, do you know where this picture came from for benzene? This was from MO theory in quantum mechanics. And so when you do MO theory on benzene, it automatically spits out this structure. It doesn't spit out these two structures. Yeah. And so this is why we call this one of the failures, maybe. It's not so serious. Okay. Now, can you see where the double bond is? Well, we can't really see the carbons. The carbons are under here. So what they did was they put this translucent. This is solid. And now we can see where the carbon atoms are. But you can't really tell which carbons have the double bond. In fact, none of them have the double bond. All the carbon carbon bonds are equivalent. They're all the same, and they're all one and a half bonds. In other words, the pi bonding, those six pi bonding electrons, are smeared out of the entire structure. And we can see that when we look at the, the density distribution here. Everything's smeared out evenly for the entire structure. So that's one of the issues you know, that can be resolved if we use MO theory. If we use MO theory, we don't have to deal with all these. And so that's what I was saying about perchlorate. We use MO theory to do perchlorate, then we aren't going to generate how many structures? Like 20? Yeah. A lot of structures. Okay, let's look at another failure. An MO theory. Or B, not MO, Valence bond theory. Another failure of Valence bond theory is for oxygen, O2. Um, Bayland's bond theory cannot predict certain properties of oxygen. Maybe we should just get rid of Bayland's bond. Well, that, that's kind of minor, but for oxygen, it's more major. So the first thing when we do Bayland's bond theory is we need to know what the structure is. So we draw out the loose structure. And the reason we need to draw the loose structure is because we need to determine what the hybridization is. What is the hybridization on oxygen? It's sp2. And then we have a double bond. A double bond consists of one sigma bond and one pi bond. A triple bond consists of one sigma and two pi. And so let's take a look at this double bond here. It's sp2 hybridized. And so I'm going to have an sp2, sp2 sigma bond between the two oxygen. And then I'm going to have two long pairs in the sp2 orbitals here. Is that it? No. That's not it. If we didn't look at oxygen, well, we're going to look at all the electrons now, including the minus 4, the minus 2, 2s, and then 2p. Oxygen is normally like this. Two electrons short of filling the octet. Well, we're going to hybridize this. What do we hybridize it as? SP2. And we will need one unhybridized P orbital here. 
So how many electrons does the oxygen have in the structure? Only one, two, three, four, five. Five electrons. So two lone pairs. And one double bond. So the, the other oxygen is going to come in here and double bond here. And it's going to be forming an SP2, SP2 sigma, and a PP pi. Where's the PP pi bond here? Well, this is the top view, and we're looking down. Actually, I should draw these over here. Yeah, here. You have a P orbital here and a P orbital here. And so we're going to end up with PP pi bond here. Here and here. That would be over here. Okay, one of the reasons why we're doing this and drawing out all these orbitals is to get a better idea of the electron cloud distribution around the molecule. It's kind of like this. <clears throat> this is called the electrostatic potential map. This kind of shows the electron cloud around the molecule. And um, when I do this, I'm going to have 1s orbitals. The 1s orbitals are going to be localized. Those don't participate in the bonding. And so there's some 1s orbitals in here that are going to have two electrons. And those are fairly localized. They aren't interacting with those. And so I'm going to have an electron cloud here and here. And then I'm going to have my sp2, sp2 sigma bond. So there's going to be an electron cloud here in the internuclear axis. And then I'm going to have my PP pi bond. The PP pi bond, I'm going to have a P lobe up here and a P lobe here. And we're going to have some overlap here and, here. and below the axis as well. So this is the top view. If I tilt this, then we can see the side view. I can tilt it so we can see the side view of the P orbital. And so one P orbital, and then another P orbital, and here we can have a PP pi bond. All right, so can I get an idea of how the electron cloud is distributed in the molecule? We get an idea about the bonding. What do you think the bond order is here? Single, double, triple? Double. Bond order is two. And we can get one other thing from this, and that is the magnetic property. This is what we call diamagnetic. Diamagnetic means there are no unpaired electrons. Because this one, which was originally unpaired, gets paired to the other oxygen. And the same thing goes to this. And so in a diamagnetic material, there are no unpaired electrons. Um, so So valence bond tells us this for O2. Valence bond gives us the electron density map. Electron density map, which is closed to NO. Valence bond tells us the bond order. The 
bond order two is the same as what we see on blue structure, as well as other ways of depicting the molecule, such as this. And we have our sp2, sp2 overlap, and our p2 overlap. And the last thing is it tells us it's diamagnetic. Whatever a theory does, it has to match with experiment. So this is okay. This is okay, but this is not okay. It turns out oxygen is not diamagnetic. Oxygen is paramagnetic. Now, paramagnetic materials behave a lot differently in the presence of a magnet. Paramagnetic materials are attracted to magnet. Diamagnetic materials are repelled. So here's a short video. Using liquid oxygen. Liquid oxygen is not white, it's colorless. So when you see these ice crystals forming on the outside, it's liquid oxygen, it's so cold. Watching. I hope you'll join us again soon for another experiment. All right. So this is a major failure. You know, the thing about delocalization, okay, we'll just have to make a hybrid. But um, this is a more serious problem. How should we redo this? You, know, you spent all that time doing this. Do you feel comfortable with this now? Maybe you feel comfortable with this now, but was it a total waste, like boar? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't spend that much time on boar because you know the boar theory. Is it valid today? No, boar boar theory was abandoned long ago. And we we can't do much with boar theory. And so the question comes up, should we abandon valence bond theory? I mean, valence bond, this is a serious failure. Maybe we should just abandon it and stick with MO. And the answer is um, no. No. Bohr, it's a different situation. Bohr failed on all elements except for hydrogen. And even for hydrogen, it had the wrong interpretation you know, Bohr had an interpretation of orbits, 
In reality, we're looking at orbital. Whereas valence bond theory, if we use valence bond to describe nitrogen, it comes out close. Nitrogen looks very similar to oxygen, except it has a triple bond rather than a double bond. And so the picture for nitrogen looks okay. And so there aren't numerous failures. Since there aren't numerous failures and there's no math involved, that means we're going to keep it. We're going to keep it and call it the light version. The light version is not going to be as good as the full version, but it's a compromise. That, um, that will do because it just makes life much easier. All right, so let's take a look. Nitrogen has a triple bond, and we can describe that quite nicely using valence bond theory. Here we're going to look at acetylene. Acetylene has a triple bond as well. Nitrogen is going to be a little bit different because it doesn't have hydrogens attached to it. Thank you. But acetylene does. And so if I have a triple bond, how many sigma bonds do I have? I have one sigma and two pi. And so what are they? Well, first off, what's the hybridization on carbon here? SP. And so each carbon is going to have two SP orbitals oriented in 180 for linear orientation. On one of these SP orbitals, we're going to have a hydrogen bond to it. So this would be an SSP sigma bond. On the other SP orbital, we're going to have another carbon come in with its SP, and we're going to get an SP, SP sigma bond. And so our sigma bond is an SP, SP sigma bond. What are our pi bonds? Well, if we only hybridize one of the PO roles, and then these are two PO roles that are unhybridized, one of the hybridized PO roles is lying in the plane of the board here. The other is perpendicular to the plane, so you can rotate it out. The one end sticks out, the other end sticks in. And so if we go with this one and overlap them, we'll end up with this. We're showing the overlap here. We want positive overlap with positive and negative to overlap with negative. And that would be good overlap. And so we're just showing you the, uh, the phase of the wave. But here we have one PP pi bond showing the overlap here. Okay, and then um, perpendicular to this, we're going to have another PP pi bond. And what they did with the second PP pi bond is they drew it in mesh. And then we'll just overlap them on the same molecule here. And so you can see the solid one, which is overlapped above and below. And you can see the mesh one. It's hard to see the mesh one. The mesh one would have overlap sticking out. And then overlap sticking in. And so those would be our two pi bonds and a triple bond. Is, um, is the mesh one the, like the same as the other one? It's just really the same yeah, it's exactly the same as the other one. It's just rotated. So, 
when we look at the um, properties of acetylene, or ethylene, it's very similar. Ethylene is diamagnetic, and when we look at the electron cloud density, it's similar to this. That is, if we look at the electrostatic potential map, and we can see how the shape of this looks similar. And so, for something like um, acetylene, it's not so bad using. Balance bond theory. Okay. But what about oxygen? Well, obviously for oxygen it is very bad. And so we're going to have to start talking about molecular orbital theory. Okay. Molecular orbital theory, there are other failures. You know, I'm having you draw energy level diagrams. Uh, I, I had you draw the energy level diagram here. And then we hybridize this SP, so it's going to be 2SP here. And we have two unhybridized P, like this. And then we'll have one carbon come in and form a double bond here. And another carbon come in and form a double bond here. So all the orbitals. So um, something should be diamagnetic. All the orbitals. Right? But there's one other thing. You know, we can excite electrons. If I accept the electron from an sp to let's say a p or an s orbital of higher energy, I should be able to generate the spectrum of that. And so even though we draw an energy level diagram, we don't actually put energies here. We don't put the delta e's either, because in valence bond we aren't going to get after it energy values here. And so in valence bond, we cannot predict the spectrum of the molecule. In MO, we can predict the spectrum of the molecule. And so that's another failure for valence bond. But MO is just a lot more work. And therefore, um, we just use it for simple cases. So the first step in MO is to do an LCAO. Do you know what LCAO stands for? Yeah. Something atomic orbital. Yeah, linear combination of atomic orbitals. LCAO. Let's do something simple first. When we do an LCAO, there are two ways of adding. Okay. So let's take a 1s orbital on one hydrogen atom and the 1s orbital on another hydrogen atom. We're going to make H2. We can make H2 using Bale's bond theory. So we make H2 using Bale's bond theory. It's pretty simple. Here. H2. We have a 1s orbital on one hydrogen and a 1s orbital on another hydrogen. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring these together closer and closer. As we bring them together, um, we can monitor the energy. You know, if they're infinitely far apart, then they're going to have the highest energy. But as we bring them, well, the highest, well, I will just say we have zero energy. So if we bring them closer together, there's going to be attraction in the internuclear region. And so here, we're going to optimize the orbital overlap so that you know we get an electron cloud that draws in the two nuclei closer together. We, we're going to have extra probability in the overlap region. The nuclei are positive, so they're going to be attracted to this extra charge density in the overlap region. If we push them too close together, what, hap ha what happens is the energy skyrockets up. Because if you push them too close together, the two nuclei begin to repel one another. And the potential energy shoots up. 
And so the optimum distance is here. This is the bond length. for H2. And so, so far this is pretty good. A 1s overlapping more than 1s. But MO is more powerful. And so let's see the way MO and H2. In MO, we do something called the LCAO, which means we take one atomic orbital, which would be the 1s orbital here, one electron. And another atomic orbital, which would be 1s on a different hydrogen, let's say here, and overlap them. So we're going to bring these two orbitals together. But we aren't going to overlap them. What we're going to do is we're going to take them and mix them. The way we can mix it is this. Let's say this is positive amplitude and positive amplitude. If I mix positive and positive amplitude, I'm going to get positive, right? Yeah. And I'm getting a good probability that the electron can be found in this intermediate region. And so the first LCAO is I'm going to mix positive and positive. And um, this is going to generate a new orbital called the sigma 1s orbital. The sigma 1s orbital looks like this. Even though it's big, it can only hold two electrons. Okay, once I make the sigma 1s, I'm going to also have to make the sigma star 1s. That is the other way of doing linear combination. If, if one's positive and the other is negative, if one's positive and the other is negative, what's going to happen to the waves? The waves are going to cancel out these conserved regions. And so what we create is what's called the anti-bonding orbital. The anti-bonding orbital is going to have the electron cloud outside the intermediate region. The bonding orbital has an electron cloud inside the intermediate region. And so that's what's going to hold the two nuclei together. But up here, the electron cloud is outside the intermediate region, which is going to break apart the molecule. And so on the one hand, you know, the bonding orbitals, the molecular orbitals, hold everything together, and the anti-bonding you know, break everything apart. And so what we're doing is we're taking two AOs and then combining them, linear combination, we add, subtract, and then we get the, these are the MOs for them. And this thing is called an MO diagram. So if we're going to make H2, then what I do is I'm going to combine this valence electron and that valence electron. And H2 is going to have a total of two valence electrons. And I fill this according to off bow, fill the lowest energy first. According to Pauli, max of two electrons with opposing spin. According to Huns, if there are more. Okay, so my picture of hydrogen looks like this. I have a sigma 1s molecular orbital. And so what I'm doing is I'm going to replace all the atomic orbitals with these molecular orbitals, at least in valence. So, the sigma 1s orbital is going to show that there's going to be pretty good probability that the electron is going to be between the two nuclei here. Not only that, there are two electrons in the sigma 1s, and they're paired. So what I can get is I can get the electron um, density map. I can get the bond order. 
Now the bond order is a bit trickier here, and so the easiest way of calculating the bond order is to sum up the bonding electrons minus the sum of the antibonding electrons and take this and divide it by two. Each antibonding electron cancels out one bonding electron. In this case, are there any antibonding? There's no antibonding. There's only bonding. And so it's going to be bonding electrons, two, minus antibonding, zero, divided by two, gives me one. And so the bond order is equal to one, which is the same as we get for valence bond. And also the, the cloud density looks the same too. When we look at valence bond and MO, kind of similar, very similar. So that's bond order, and then magnetic properties. What are the magnetic properties of this? Is it diamagnetic or paramagnetic? This is diamagnetic. There are no unpaired electrons. So we can try different things here. MO is a bit more powerful. You know, although it's, you could use valence bond to predict something like this. But let's predict H2 plus. Do you predict H2 plus to exist? Seems like it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to draw our MO diagram. Our MO diagram is going to consist of sigma 2s and sigma star 2s. The sigma 2s orbital is a big orbital that is going to encompass both hydrogens here. And the sigma star 2s is going to be an antibonding orbital. So, so H2 plus is going to have three electrons total. No, not three, one electron, H2 plus, one electron, so we just write one electron here. So this is expected to be paramagnetic, because unpaired electrons. It's bond order, what do you calculate? It's the number of bonding electrons, one minus antibonding electrons, zero, divided by two. So this bond order is one half. It means it's got about a half bond in there. And then we can see the electron cloud, electron distribution is going to look like this with one electron worth of density in the S. All right, this is for the first row, the first shell. What do we do with the second shell? The second shell is going to get a bit more complicated. And so let's take a look at the second shell now. We could do other species too. So for example, we did H2+. Plus. You, you may omit the atomic orbitals. But sometimes writing the atomic orbitals here is helpful for centering the But um, when we look at H2, we have um, two electrons in bonding, the bond order is one, it's diamagnetic. When we look at H2 plus, one electron in bonding, bond order is one half. How about H2 minus? Uh, H2 minus is going to have one extra electron, so that's going to throw one electron in the antibonding. If we have a one electron in the antibonding, then it's going to weaken it, and we're going to get a bond order of one and a half. But what about H2 2 minus? If we get H2 2 minus, then that's going to give us um, four electrons. 
And if we look at sigma 1s, and then sigma star 1s, and we have four electrons, we're going to just fill these up. One, two, three, four. And then if we add the bond order, the bond order is the number of bonding electrons, two, minus the number of antibonding electrons, two, divided by two, which gives us zero. And so H2, two minus is predicted not to exist. There's nothing in it that's going to hold the atoms together. Yeah. What about He2? Well, He2 is the exact same thing. He2 only has two electrons. We have two of them, so we're going to have a total of four electrons. We put two of them in the sigma 1s and two of them in the sigma star 1s. When we do that, then um, they cancel each other out. So, for example, if I have two in the sigma 1s, this is bonding, so I have an electron cloud distribution here between the nuclei that's going to hold the nuclei together. This is electron cloud that's going to be here. But when I look at the sigma star 1s, the sigma star 1s is too low. Out here, and one out here. And so if I compare these two lobes, then um, they're going to repel one another. And so the antibonding cancels out the bonding in this particular case. Let's see here. The antibonding cancels out the bond. And so the way we describe a bond in MO is different than the way we describe it in valence bond. The way we describe a bond in valence bond is the overlap of the atomic orbitals creates a higher charge of density between the nuclei, whether directly along the internuclear axis, sigma, or above and below the internuclear axis, pi. Nonetheless, like that. In MO, what we need is we need more bonding electron density versus antibonding. And so if we have just the same number, then the antibonding will cancel out the bonding and we get no bond form. So we need net bonding electron. Alright, so what about second period? Second period is going to be more complex than first period. And so the second period we have to start involving the P orbitals. And so we'll have the two S. The two S orbitals are the LCA looks very similar. And the two P orbitals are going to be a bit more complicated, so I'll run out of time, so we'll talk about that next time. Uh,